Hello. I want you to test the microphone. So can you please give us a chat message if you can hear this and it is good? If it is not good, maybe I need to move the microphone closer or further away. So if you can tell us by chat where you want the microphone, we will move it. So Alessandro is waiting to hear from you. Has anyone said anything? It's good. Mike, Mike is okay. Good. Thank you. The mic is okay. If there is any problem, you chat Alessandro, and he will tell me, and we will fix the problem. But for now, we are going to begin. Thank you for having me into your home. I have been looking forward a lot to coming to this class and speaking to you. This is a different kind of setting because you can see me, but I can only imagine you. So I am imagining a lot of different Brazilian homes with people listening on their computer. And English classes are usually interactive. Usually, I speak to you, you speak to me, we have um, misunderstanding, and then we laugh, and then we point to something, or we act out what we are trying to say, and then we figure it out. And it's a lot of fun. But right now, you are at your house, and I am here. So that will make it different. In fact, I have never heard of an English class being taught remotely. In other words, being taught by video in this way. So this class will be new. Olavo has designed the idea for this class. He wants us to study this book. This book we will speak of later, but it is called The Living Principle. English as a Discipline of Thought. Olavo loves this book. When we read it together every week, he reads and reads and he says, this is the good part. And then he reads some more. And I think this is a very difficult book. When I started to study this book, to prepare for this class, I thought, oh no, I am stupid. I cannot understand this book. So I asked my friend Alessandro, who is sitting right there receiving your chat messages, and he also read some of this book. And he said, oh no. I am too stupid to understand this book. This is a difficult, difficult book. But Olavo wants you to read it and understand it. So in this class, we are going to study this book. And when you can read this book, you will know English very well. So let me also tell you, I spoke to my friend Alessandro in the last month. We have been talking about this class a lot. And Alessandro speaks English very well, pretty well. And he was able to go to an English university, a very difficult high-level university. 
called St. John's College and graduate. So he is very good in English. But he said to me that he had studied English in Brazilian university and high school, in Brazilian schools, and he was not able to learn very well. And he did not really begin to understand English until there was a book that he wanted to read very much. This is the book. It's called Autobiographical Reflections by Eric Vogelin. As you can see, it is very large. It is huge, enormous book. Very difficult. But Alessandro really wanted to read it. So he got a dictionary and he got a notebook and he began to read. And when he read, he would stop and take notes and make sure he understood. And little by little, he began to understand more. And after one year of reading this book, he finished this book and he was able to read English. So you will be very much improved in your English after we study this book. But this book is not about English. It's not an ESL book, okay? It is not a book that is an English grammar book. It is a real book. It is a book of philosophy. And it is a book that Olavo wants you to read and understand because it's a very important book for his uh, philosophy students. That's why we're calling the class English for Philosophy Students. Before we begin with this book, I want to tell you something about learning English. I will say this today, but then I will never say it again, okay? Learning English or learning any language is not the same as learning another subject like mathematics or history or social studies or philosophy. Okay. Each of those subjects has content that you learn, you memorize, and you understand the content. So you learn the subject. Language is not like that. You do not learn a language in the same way that you learn mathematical principles. Language is a skill. It is something you use, it is a tool. It is something you use to help you do something else. So your brain learns language differently than it learns academic content. The portion of your brain which learns language is different than the portion of your brain which learns school subjects or academic subjects. Your brain incorporates language into its operating system like a language on a computer. If your computer has an operating language, then it can function to store data 
and manipulate data. The operating language is part of the machine. Now, your brain will learn English all by itself without you trying too hard. What you must do is use the language. When you are interacting with me in English, communicating with me in English, your brain is working to understand and to create the language in your language center of your brain. So it is best if you forget that we are studying English and only think we are studying philosophy. If you are focused on philosophy, you will forget that you are studying English. And if you forget that you are studying English, that is best for your brain. Because the conscious part of your brain can interfere with the unconscious portion, which creates the language for your use. One reason that people study English but cannot use it is because they study it as a school topic, as a subject in school. They are focusing on the English instead of using English to focus on something that they want to learn or want to experience. So in this class, we will try to have fun, to laugh, to tell jokes, to answer questions that you really have, real questions, and also to learn some philosophy that Olavo will be happy that you learn. And in the process, without even noticing, your English will improve. It will improve a lot. Okay, so we will talk about English sometimes. We will talk about grammar and I'll write on the board how something works. But mostly we will talk about philosophy or current events, what's happening in the world or uh, some question I ask you and then you respond over the course of the week by email. We will try to use English and then you will find that you improve. In addition to um, interacting with me in this class, I recommend you do some more things to help your English progress. One thing you need to do, I'll erase the board and maybe write a list. Okay, one thing you need to do is find a way to hear English. So I'm going to write the word listening on the board. Um, some, the easiest way to, to learn a language is to only learn to read and write and never listen or speak because with reading and writing, you can use a dictionary, you can take all the time you want to understand and to construct a sentence. A reading knowledge 
is relatively easy to get in any language. But in our day and age, you do not want to settle for reading alone. You want to be able to speak and listen. You want to be able to talk on the phone or to listen to the news or to watch movies in English. So we are going to work in this class on speaking and listening. And at your house, you need to be able to speak. Sometimes I will say, repeat after me. And I will say something and then you will repeat it at home. And hopefully your children will not laugh at you. Your dog will not bark. You will be speaking to the computer, but I need you to speak and listen. But for now, I recommend you find as many ways as possible to listen to native speakers speaking English. The way your brain works is Um, when you are a baby, you begin to hear the language of your mother. Now, when you are a baby, you can say any sound, a sound that right now you cannot make because it is too strange and foreign, maybe the click of an African tribes person or the, um, the back of the throat sound of the French. Maybe you cannot make these sounds right now because you are an adult. But when you were a baby, you could make every sound that the human mouth and throat can produce. Also, when you were a baby, you could make sounds which we call vowels. Vowels. For me in English, it's A, E, I, O, and U. And the vowel sounds are A, E, I, A, O, A. Uh. Okay. Now, these vowel sounds that I gave you in English are not the same as the vowel sounds that you have in Portuguese. When you were a baby, your mother spoke to you in Portuguese. And when you responded with a sound that sounded like Portuguese, she said, yay, and she encouraged you. And you, maybe you said, mama, and she said, yay, and you learned that mama is a word and mama was not, or mama, or me, me was not. When you said me, me, she said, be quiet. You are whining, you are crying, that's bad. But when you said mama, she said, yay. So you learned that the vowel is ah and not me. You learned. Each language has their own sounds. And each child learns what those sounds are from their mother and their family. When you become 12 years old or so, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 years old. 
your brain changes. And your brain is no longer interested in learning what the sounds are. Your brain decides that the sounds of your mother tongue are the only sounds there are. And every other sound must mean the same as Portuguese sounds. So it becomes hard to understand the different sounds of another language. It is hard, but it is not impossible. You must open your mind to the idea that a sound that you are hearing is completely different from a Portuguese sound, but it is meaningful. It is hard for me to explain this to you, but you need to understand consciously that the specific sounds of Portuguese are not the same as the sounds of English or any other language. So you have to give your brain permission to wipe the slate clean and to really listen and not translate into Portuguese. Okay? There are words in English which contain sounds that do not exist in Portuguese. And there are some sounds in Portuguese which do not exist in English. So if you speak an English word substituting a Portuguese sound, it will not be good. You will have an accent, a bad accent that the Americans will not understand. People won't understand you. So you do not substitute sounds, making the Portuguese equivalent. Do not do that. Do not take a Portuguese sound and consider this is the correct way of saying this sound. No, leave it for Portuguese and say the funny sounding, different sounding, American sounding sounds mimic, copy my voice. Try to pretend that you are an American and you're putting on an accent and making fun of Americans by speaking in their way. And you'll sound like an American. So all this comes back to listening. If you will listen to English on the internet, on the television, on the radio, the more you listen, freely listen, without trying too hard to understand, just let the language flow over your ears as much as possible, what will happen is your brain will begin to understand the new sound system. Your brain will begin to construct the sound system. I'm going to give you an example. This may be hard for you to hear uh, right now, but if you can hear it, it will be a good example of what I am talking about. 
speaking of vowels. Well, we'll keep it in order. Okay, I'm going to demonstrate the sound for each of these vowels. I think it will be hard for you to hear the difference between what we call I and what we call E. Most internationals cannot tell the difference just by listening because the difference between the sound we make for I and the sound we make for E is only a very slight uh, movement of the jaw, very slight difference. So let me demonstrate. E, E. E, E. Bet, bit. Bat, bet, bit. Bot, but. Now, if I were showing you a um, human mouth, like for the dentists, they have the teeth. If I had a, a mouth with teeth to show you how to make these sounds, it would be bat, bet, bit, bot, but. So the mouth is a little more open for a ah and a. Ah. It is more closed for e, eh, i, eh, a. Uh. There's also a difference of the tongue. E, eh, i, eh, my tongue is forward, my tongue is middle, and my tongue is back. E, eh, i, eh, a. Uh. Now, all vowels are formed by a mouth that is more open or less open. In every language, it's either more open or less open. And in every language, the tongue is either forward, middle, or back. It's somewhere in there. There is no magic cut off. It is arbitrary. It could be this far or this far or this far. A native speaker of a language learns to hear it exactly and learns to produce it exactly. But then you go to another language and in your language it should be here. So when you hear this, you bump it in and you hear it the wrong way. So what you need to do is listen, listen, listen to TV, to lectures, to movies, to radio, to real speakers and to me. And gradually your brain will learn where the cutoffs are for the English vowels. You will learn it, but um, it takes a lot of listening, weeks and weeks of immersion. Maybe, maybe if you lived here for three or four weeks and lived and listened and listened and listened in three weeks, you would begin to hear it. So it takes time and repetition for your brain to do this. And you must give it that time, okay? 
So I recommend that you take every opportunity to listen to English. And don't worry if you don't understand, even if you understand nothing. It will be good for you to listen because your brain will be constructing the sound system. And after your brain constructs the sound system, words will begin to have meaning. You'll begin to be able to hear. So, listening. Also, um, I suggest, if you want, it's up to you. Maybe this won't help some of you, and maybe it will help some of you. But if you want a self-study course to learn the grammar and vocabulary um, in a systematic way, which is a good thing also, I suggest maybe you should order this book, Essential Grammar in Use, Raymond Murphy. And it can come in an edition with a CD. It has exercises and practice for self-study. And you might want to have a notebook, notebook like this, where you can keep track of your vocabulary keep track of pattern sentences that are used a lot, keep track of idioms, which are phrases that they don't have a literal meaning. Uh, they have a figurative meaning. They are colorful speech that you learn. Phrases, keep track of them, keep track of grammar. So, in other words, it is good to study the language, but it is also good to use it and to listen. Okay? So, those are some suggestions for language learning. Now, let me see how we're doing on time. Our plan for this class is to um, spend a lot of time studying this book in the class. This is Olavo's method. He is studying English this way himself. He and I together are studying difficult English literature, um, line by line, word by word, when necessary. Um, Olavo has told me to go very slowly. Maybe we can do only 10 lines in one class, but if we really know those 10 lines, it's good. So we will study this book. Also, we will discuss your questions. All week long, you can send me questions to my email address. You can speak English or you can speak Portuguese because Alessandro and Isabella will be reading the emails and I will read emails. And at the beginning of class on Thursday, we will choose certain questions to answer at the beginning of class. So we will, I will not reply to your emails personally, directly, but I will answer questions in class that you have sent. Okay, so here is the email address. Let me erase this now and give you the email address. Okay, it is 
margarita.noise, that's my name, at seminario de filosofía filosofía dot org That's a long address. So, you should write that address down. I'll be very happy to read your emails and your feedback. Olavo said that we will study this book as long as you enjoy it and are benefiting from it. He said maybe you will not enjoy it, but maybe you will benefit. Maybe it is good for you, even if you do not enjoy it. But we want to do what works for you. So please send your ideas, your suggestions, your hope and preference for what you would like to do with this time. I would like to interact with you. I would like to speak to you and to have you speak back. So every um, class period we will probably, this is the idea for now, we will begin with your questions, then we will study philosophy, then we will take a short break get a drink of water, some coffee, whatever, five minutes. Then we will come back and answer questions that you send through chat or email in real time. Okay? And we may do that for a half an hour or 40 minutes, something like that. So we are going to have your questions today, and you can ask anything you want, anything at all. It doesn't have to be about English or about philosophy or you can ask what I think of President Obama or you can ask um, any personal question and we will talk. Okay, so think now what your questions are. Any question. This is a great chance for you, a great opportunity. So. Um, let's see, do we even have time to begin the philosophy book? Yes. Okay, we're going to begin. This is a hard book. I feel sorry for you, but Alavo says we have to study this book. This is a very hard book. Okay. Whenever we study a book, we look at the title we think about the author, we read the front and the back and anything we can get to preview the book. Unfortunately, the cover is gone, so I don't have any idea what it is about from the cover. But the title is The Living Principle, English as a Discipline of Thought by F. R. Levis. Now, Levis was an English teacher in Cambridge, in England, in the 20th century. He, um, his works are um, not studied currently today. They have passed out of common study. However, he was a great educator, and his ideas were right on. And he saw what was happening to the academic culture in England in the 
nineteen hundreds and also in the culture at large and he sounded an alarm in this book so that is who Levis is let us see I think I don't know if you are holding this book or whether you are only looking at a PDF version I don't know whether they have the front piece okay I want to begin not with the acknowledgments because the acknowledgments aren't interesting to me but on my copy page 7 we have a quote from Wittgenstein he says give up literary criticism Wittgenstein did not believe in literary criticism but Levis believes that literary criticism is foundational to all education now we have a quote from D H Lawrence I knew then and I know now it is no use trying to do anything I speak only for myself publicly it is no use trying merely to modify present forms the whole great form of our era will have to go and nothing will really send it down but the new shoots of life springing up and slowly bursting the foundations and one can do nothing but fight tooth and nail to defend the new shoots of life from being crushed out and let them grow we can't make life we can but fight for the life that grows in us D H Lawrence note to the crown okay this paragraph is difficult to understand but it contains the heart of why Levis titled this book the living principle so let us read this quote more slowly and understand the images okay I'm going to erase the board okay first sentence I knew then and I know now it is no use trying to do anything I speak only for myself publicly okay the first thing to understand is why he puts the phrase I speak only for myself between dashes okay he says I knew then and I know now the fact that he says I knew then I think I'm going to write more of this on the board I knew then okay this is a quote taken out of context we do not know what then refers to we know that now is at the time of his writing so he is saying he knew before 
And he knows now. What does he know? He knows that it is no use trying to do anything publicly. still hear me. I, I did not place this into where he placed it. When you put something in between dashes, it's inserted as extra information. In order to understand a complex sentence, you need to take it out and then put the sentence back together. So in this case, he put, I speak for myself here. So anything and publicly needed to be brought back together so that you can see that he is trying to say, it is no use trying to do anything publicly. I speak only for myself. Means he, he is speaking for himself, not for his organization or his family or common knowledge of everybody agrees. No, this is his idea. Okay, that's what I speak only for myself means. I put it in as an infix in the sentence. So he set it off with dashes. So the main sentence is, it is no use trying to do anything publicly. Or you could consider that the main sentence is, I know that it is no use trying to do anything publicly. Okay, publicly means um, in the media and writing journalistic articles and speaking out in the public square. If you do not act publicly, then you are acting privately. He is going to say that we must do something behind the scenes. So he knew then and he knows now that it is no use. It will not work if we try to do something publicly. And this is only his opinion. In his opinion alone, we must not try to do anything publicly. Now, do anything about what? About what problem? We read on, okay? I knew then and I know now, it is no use trying to do anything I speak only for myself publicly. It is no use trying merely to modify present forms. Okay, it is no use trying merely to modify. Um, merely means only. It is no use, that means it will not work, trying merely to modify. Modify means change, and merely means only. So he's saying we must not just change the forms, whatever forms he's talking about, forms, the present forms, merely to modify 
the present forms. Okay, present means now, forms is the shape of things as they are. Okay, so it is no use trying only to change these things. What must we do? Oh, the whole great form of our era will have to go. That's a big thing. The whole great form. Two adjectives to modify form. The whole means the entire. Great means huge and large. The enormous form of our era. Era means time. Form means shape. The shape of our entire time will have to go. Will have to go means get rid of it, destroy it. The whole great form of our era will have to go. This means he is seeing problems in society which are so large, they are everywhere, and they will have to go. And nothing will really send it down but the new shoots of life springing up and slowly bursting the foundations. Okay, this is a good image. Imagine a building, a very old stone building made of rock and concrete and um, maybe a castle from a thousand years ago. It's very strong. What can send it down? Maybe if you have green leafy vines that grow up on the stones and push their tendrils in and then the rain comes and they grow and expand and little by little the rock crumbles and this huge stone powerful edifice is crumbled by a little plant that grows up and sends its tendrils into the cracks and breaks it in pieces. This is the image. New shoots of life coming up will break down the great form of our era and get rid of it. The only thing that can get rid of this bad, this is a bad form in our era, will be the new shoots of life coming up. The question is, what does the shoot of life refer to? Now, I have been studying this book with Olavo, so I can tell you what it refers to. It refers to human creativity and intelligence and wisdom and um, learning. In our day, education has taken on a form which does not allow the human mind to reach its full potential. In our day, students are not taught to think, to reason soundly. In our day, children are not fed good literature, good history, good morality, 
um, good science even. They're not fed good data to build strong brains. In our day, students are not taught. And as a result, people are becoming unable to think. And our, um, our culture in America, and according to Olavo, the culture in Brazil is, is the same or worse. In our, in our country of the United States, people are becoming unable to recognize when an argument is good or bad. They are unable to recognize a good philosophical argument. They cannot recognize truth or falsehood. They cannot even understand their own heart and their own thoughts. And a large part of this is because the form of education is bad. Now, what will bring that form down? according to D.H. Lawrence, is new shoots of life coming up. So the young people of the world, which is you, the hope of Brazil, the hope of the world is you. You are the people who have the potential by your very thoughts to send out the tendrils into the culture and into the society, which can crumble the form which is bringing stupidity and wrecking ruin in your culture. So, reading on. One can do nothing but fight tooth and nail to defend the new shoots of life from being crushed out and let them grow. Now what D.H. Lawrence is saying, in the last sentence I'll read also, we can but fight for the life that grows in us. We can't make life. We can only fight for it. Okay, what D.H. Lawrence is saying and what Olavo is saying and what I say, because I am also an educator, is we cannot make life. We cannot create life in our test tube. Life comes only from God and from other life. We cannot make life, but we can defend it and fight for it. Now, you are the life. If you can be educated and can train your mind then the life which is in you will send out creative tendrils, ideas, into all walks of your community, into the medical community, the legal community, the educational community, the political community, and into the neighborhoods wherever you are. And little by little, you will bring down the edifice which is crushing your nation. So, it says, we can, one can do nothing. That means one person can do nothing, and we can't do anything, except fight tooth and nail. Fight tooth and nail is a very common idiom in English. We use it all the time. You should write it down and learn it. Fight tooth and nail. And it means to use every opportunity at your disposal to fight vigorously, to do everything almost in a passionate way to fight. That's what tooth and nail means as a wolf fights with tooth and nail. So it's a vivid, strong idiom. So we can fight tooth and nail to defend 
the new shoots of life. So Olavo wants to defend you so that you can grow intellectually and morally and spiritually so that you can become strong. He will hold back the forces which are trying to rob you of your education so that you will not be able to fight yourself when you're older. Okay, so we can fight to the nail to defend the new shoots of life from being crushed out, which is what would happen if nobody was defending you. And we can let them grow. So you have to be growing. We can't make life, but we can fight for the life that grows in us. So that's D.H. Lawrence, Note to the Crown. Could you explain the word shoot? Shoot. Um, a shoot is the beginning of a plant that comes up. And the other word I used quite a bit was tendril. T-E-N-D-R-I-L. I use that word a lot. Tendril is the little root of the vine that goes in to the stone or to the wood or to whatever it's clinging to. It goes in. So the shoot is the new, new growth of a brand new young plant. Any other questions? Okay, uh, shall we go on and do the final quote or should we stop now and take the break? Okay, we'll do this final quote and then we'll begin with the preface probably next week. Okay, one more quote. This quote is from uh, F.R. Levis, the author of the book. These remarks that we're about to read were made by him when he gave the first chapter of this book in the form of lectures um, at the University of York. So here is a quote from Levis's lecture speaking of the material in this book. There is no, re I will, I'm going to read the whole thing first, then we'll pick it apart. Okay, so we'll read the whole thing first. There's no redeeming the democratic mass university. The civilization it represents has almost overnight ceased to believe in its own assumptions and recoils nihilistically from itself. If you believe in humanity at all, you will know that nothing today is more important than to keep alive the idea of the university function, the essential university function and what goes with it, the idea of an educated public. My preoccupation is to ensure that the living seed exists and that the life in it has the full pregnancy. Just how it will strike and take and develop, as it must if there is to be a human future, one cannot foresee. Change is certainly upon us, menacing and certainly drastic. To meet it, there must be opportunism. The opportunism that answers to a profound realization of the need. And it's the prelusive remarks before giving thought, language, and object objectivity in lecture installments at the University of York. Okay, let's read this more slowly. There is no redeeming the democratic mass university. Remember D.H. Lawrence said, the whole thing will have to go. He also said, um, it is no use trying to merely modify the present forms. Remember, merely modify. That means the same as what Levis is saying when he says there is no redeeming the democratic mass university. He is saying you cannot merely modify it. It all has to go. It's totally corrupt.
and bad. You cannot redeem it. What is the democratic mass university? Democratic mass university. Okay, the university, as you know, is a group of colleges, a group of schools, all under one roof, that interact with one another. There's nothing wrong with a university. The problem is the democratic mass university. Levis was speaking probably in maybe the 1970s when he said these remarks. Maybe 1970, early, early 1970s. Now, previous to that, the university was a place for scholars to go to complete a high education. However, in the middle of the 19th, uh, 20th century, the idea came about that it was undemocratic to have an educated elite, to have only a few people who are scholars and many people who know trades, uh, who are craftsmen, who work for a living. Okay. So somewhere they got the that everybody should be a scholar. It's not fair for some people to have higher knowledge and others not to have high knowledge, they thought. So they said everybody should go to college. It is undemocratic if some people are higher than someone else. We must elevate everyone. Now, the net result of this thinking was not that they elevated everyone. The result was that they pulled down the few who were high before. They changed the system so that an intelligent, scholarly young man or woman who wanted to pursue studies seriously could not go far if more people, most people, were not able to go so far. So the democratic mass university is the idea that Everybody should be in the university. We should educate the masses. That is, educate many, many young people, almost everyone. So now we have a university system that has tons of people, lots and lots and lots of people, but the quality is not good because most people are not fit to be exceptionally good scholars. So there is no redeeming the democratic mass university. The civilization it represents has almost overnight ceased to believe in its own assumptions and recoils nihilistically from itself. Okay, what assumptions? First of all, the civilization it represents. The mass university represents a civilization which brought it into being. The civilization is the one that says every young person can be a scholar. Every person can be intelligentsia. Everyone can succeed academically on a high level. The civilization boldly 
and ambitiously made that statement and brought the students in to a large mass education approach. And almost overnight, the civilization realized it, it can't be. It's not working. Education, high education, is not possible. Not only is it impossible for the masses, it is impossible even for the few elite. It's impossible. They lost faith in the very assumption that made them create the mass university. Okay, they lost faith in the idea that high education is possible for anyone. And then they recoiled. Recoil is to draw back in disgust or horror. They recoiled from themselves and developed a self-hatred, the civilization. Nihilistically, um, believing that there is no hope. Okay? If you believe in humanity at all, you will know that nothing today is more important than to keep alive the idea of the university function, the essential university function, and what goes with it, the idea of an educated public. Okay, Levis writes long sentences. This book is full of long, complex sentences. This particular sentence is kind of easy to understand, but it is beginning to be a characteristic Levis long sentence. So let's begin to understand the structure of this sentence. Let's see. Okay. If you believe in humanity at all, you will know that nothing today is more important than to keep alive the idea of the university function. I am not only an English teacher, I am also a math teacher. And when you have a long math sentence, let me give you an example. Suppose someone told you to evaluate this. Okay, my ninth graders are learning to evaluate sentences like this, even longer. What you must do when you have a sentence like this is you must find the innermost value first. So, if it were me, I would start here. This is the innermost, most difficult to get at. So, I would say, okay, how do I simplify this? And for those of you who know math, I may make a mistake here. I'm making this up right now. No math book is giving us the answers. But it would be something like this. It would be... This is 7 uh, to the 1 half. And this raises it to the 1 fourth. 
Therefore, this entire thing is 7 to the 1 eighth. Okay? And that's a plus. Um, then I would look at this. Or this. You want to get to the inside of things. So maybe I would look at this and I would say, okay, this means negative means 1 over. And again, we are x to the 7th and its absolute value. So it's going to be the positive. Okay, so we, we can just maybe get rid of get rid of this. So there we have that. So now we have x to the third plus that minus, and then we would have to evaluate this. So at any rate, the point is, before you can understand the entire sentence, you have to go to the very inside and understand what's in the middle. And there may be more than one place that you have to go in to find out what it's saying. Then when you understand each of the parts, you have simplified every part, then you think, how does it fit together? So in this case, it would be 12. Well, this means cube root. And this would be a negative 12. And then that's plus. Okay, so now we have, or if we want to be consistent, we could say x to the one-third. Okay, so now we know what each thing means, and we know how they relate, and it would be very easy to evaluate this if we had what it equals. Now, this sentence is a little bit like that. To understand this sentence... I would begin with the phrase, the university function. What is the university function? So it tells you what the university function is. Let's see, where is it? Okay, you look in the middle of the sentence. It says, keep alive the idea of the university function the essential university function and what goes with it, the idea of an educated public. Okay, the university function is to educate the public. The university function is to dispense education, to facilitate education. And education is good because it enables the plant to grow. It enables human creativity to be expressed, to be developed and expressed. So the university function is to take those students which are capable of higher thought and greater creativity than the masses and train those students so that they can put forth creative ideas. So the university function is to dispense education. The, and then it goes on to say the essential university function and what goes with it, the idea of an educated public. Now remember, the assumption that um, we spoke of earlier, which the civilization has lost hope in and recoil from, the assumption was that everybody could be educated. But here it is saying the idea that the public can be educated. There is a difference. When you say the idea of an educated public, you are not saying everybody has to go to university. What you are saying is that education is general and dispersed among the common man according to people's ability. And the idea of an educated public is inherent in the university's um, purpose. The university exists to enable us to have an educated public.
And it's reasonable to have that. Okay, so let's move back in the sentence. If you believe in humanity at all, you will know that nothing today is more important than to keep alive the idea of the university function. Okay, keep alive the idea. That's our next little thing we're trying to simplify. We have to keep alive the idea of the university function. So the civilization has lost hope. The civilization does not believe it is possible to educate the public anymore. They gave up. But we, if we believe in humanity at all, must believe that it is possible to educate the public. So I think we have the whole sentence now. If you believe in humanity at all, see, what Levis is saying is that without education, humanity isn't really humanity. Humanity is less, more toward the beasts, more toward animals, less toward our godly nature. Humanity is not elevated without education. So if we believe in humanity in a lofty sense at all, we must believe in the idea of an educated public, the idea of the university. We cannot give up on the university. Now, the mass democratic university is not what we're talking about. The mass democratic university is the form which is crushing the life out of students. But the university function, the ability of academic people such as myself and Olavo and other teachers to train the next generation, the function of education we must believe in. Okay, we must continue to believe in it. My preoccupation, Levis's preoccupation, that which occupies his thoughts and his heart, is to ensure that the living seed exists. The living seed is the creative minds of students. And that the life in it has full pregnancy. In other words, that the, the creative urge of young people today have the opportunity to grow and develop so that they can fully bear fruit. Just how it will strike and take and develop, just how that life will look, whether it will you will be a lawyer, a teacher, a mother, a father, a politician, a judge, just how it will look, a tradesman, whatever, just how it will look, we don't know. But, that life must take root and develop if there is to be a human future. One can't foresee what it will look like. Change is certainly upon us, menacing and certainly drastic. He uses the word certainly twice. That was not an accident. Levis is an expert writer. If he used the word certainly twice, it is for emphasis. If we repeat the same word twice, we must do it for emphasis. Otherwise, it is bad English. He's not guilty of bad English. He says, change is certainly upon us, which means no one can say, nothing has changed. It's all the way it ever was. Students were always this way. A hundred years ago, students were like this. They will always be this way. No. Change is certainly upon us. Menacing and certainly drastic. Menacing means it is dangerous. It is a danger to us. Menacing is a negative word. It is coming upon us to hurt 
us. Change, the change is not good. The change is not progress. Change is menacing and certainly drastic. Drastic means large, enormous. Okay, so we have changes upon us, certainly. It is menacing us and it is drastic. To meet it, so we're not going to run away from this change. We're going to meet it head on. We're going to meet it. To meet it, there must be opportunism. Opportunism is an important word here. It means find a way. Find a way where there is no way. It means catch an opportunity. Usually, in times when there is no change, we have systems in place which make everything smooth and easy. And a student grows up, goes to school, goes to college, becomes educated, gets a job, becomes a responsible citizen, has children, and it continues. There is no need for opportunism. The path is laid out. But suppose the path is cut off and there is no obvious, easy way to go forward. Then you have to hunt. You have to say, can I fit through here? Can I fit through here? Can I go under the block? Can I go over the block? Can I make a hole through the block? I have an opportunity here, an opportunity there. I can take one class with Olavo. I can take listen to a lecture online. I can do this, I can do that, I can read a book. Opportunism means make a way where there is no way. Find something new. Find a way. So he is saying, in order to meet the changes that are coming upon the world, there must be opportunism because the changes are so large that they will block every easy way. You must find a new way in order to get around the block to getting your education and developing your mind. Okay. Okay. Uh, there must be opportunism. The opportunism that answers to a profound realization of the need. La that is the last sentence. I want to leave this with an example. Suppose you are in a house which is on fire and the door is blocked with flame. How hard will you try to get out the window? If it is two stories up, will you jump? If there is glass, will you break it? Will you break the glass with your elbow if there is not a hammer present? How will you jump if it's three stories? What will you do if the house is on fire? Your opportunism will be in proportion to your need. Opportunism that answers to a profound realization of the need. If you do not feel the heat and hear the crackling of the flames, maybe you will not put your elbow through a glass window or jump two stories down. Maybe you will wait and see if someone will come and rescue you. But if the heat is on and the fire is coming, you'll do what it takes to get out of the house. That is what Levis is saying when he says there must be opportunism, the opportunism that answers to a profound realization of the need. So that's all we'll do for today of our book. We got through one page. We'll start the preface next week, which will be challenging. Uh, break now and then questions.
Hello again. We have some questions and some comments. The first is just a comment and I'll share it with you. Change is certainly upon us, menacing and certainly drastic. And the student writes, is it not ironic and prophetic that change was the key word of the Obama campaign? Obama. You are thinking like an American. These days when anyone says change, someone is sure to say Obama. And it's always a big joke around here. But yes, it is ironic. Okay, one student has asked for clarification on the new shoots of life springing up. Okay, new shoots of life. New shoots of life springing up. Okay, the whole thing is an image. It is supposed to make something happen in your mind. What you are to see is a seed with a plant coming up. So if you start with a seed, maybe it is a bean, and you plant it under the soil, it will burst open and a root will go down and a shoot will go up. This is the shoot, and it is going up. The words springing up refer to the unfolding with a lot of movement. The whole thing is not literal. Shoots of life mean, means this is a metaphor. And what the author means well, let's read it again. One can do nothing but fight tooth and nail to defend the new shoots of life from being crushed out and let them grow. Um, earlier he says, nothing will really, well, I'll read earlier. The whole great form of our era will have to go and nothing will really send it down but the new shoots of life springing up and slowly bursting the foundation. Okay, the idea is We have a heavy weight, that is the uh, mass democratic university, or maybe just the whole educational structure. And it is pressing down to crush all life so that human beings will not be able to think clearly and um, creatively contribute to the wisdom of humanity. So what can break this up and break it apart? new life growing and sending its roots in will break apart this thing eventually and it will crumble. So new life coming from below, if we can protect 
and allow this to grow, it has the potential of shattering the stupidity and dull, dull thinking of the masses. And there was a question about my preoccupation is to ensure that the living seed exists and that the life in it has the full pregnancy. So my preoccupation means Levis's um, intentions and goals and thoughts all go toward one goal, to ensure. And yes, that is a verb. He wants to make sure that this seed exists and it has a chance to grow up fully so that it can bring down this structure. So what is the seed? The seed is the human potential of creativity that is in a child, a human child. If they are allowed to grow and their mind is trained, then they will have the full pregnancy of an adult, of a fully grown plant that can send out these tendrils. So the seed is the intellectual potential of young people. And then the full pregnancy is don't make them stupid when they're little. Don't make them retarded. Don't cut off their intellectual development. Keep them safe so they can grow. And when they're strong, they'll bring down the crushing weight of our day, of the bad education in our day. Okay, that was um, one question. Is that good on that one, or should I move on to another? Are you getting chat, or? Okay, um, what do uh, we think about the dictionaries with pronunciation on CD? Are they useful? Yes, they are useful. Um, I spoke with my Brazilian friends and they have said that they are especially good if you can compare British English and American pronunciation. It'll help you to recognize words, but where the problem is is they will give you a clear pronunciation of a word in isolation by itself. And in conversation, the word usually sounds different. So in my class, I will teach you some pronunciations that are fast. For example, I'll tell you one that comes up in English classes here in the United States, which illustrates the principle. This is a, a dialogue that we practice in classes, in English classes here for internationals. So if you are at work with someone and they say, would you like to come to lunch with me? You say, I would love to come, but I have to work. So it's a way of saying, no, thank you. I can't come. Now, if you spell every word out, it sounds like this. I would love to come, but I have got to work. If you're actually in conversation with Americans, they will say, I'd love to come, but I got to work. I'd love to come, but I got to work. So, but I have got 
to work becomes, but I got to work. And the only word that is pronounced there really is work. And that can be substituted. Maybe, but I got to go home. Or, um, but I got to sleep. Or, but I got to wait for my daughter. But I got to. Okay, so, but I have got to becomes, but I got to. So, dictionaries that give you um, pronunciations are especially good for, for difficult content words, but in conversation, we need to practice in an English class fast pronunciation. So, but I gotta, which is really like, but I gotta, but I gotta, but I gotta, but I gotta. So, that's kind of hard to say, but um, it gives you the principle. Okay, let's see. Okay, um, when I am watching movies, I feel that I don't understand it all. But when I activate the caption in Portuguese, I comprehend almost all the words in the movie. Why? So you're listening to the movie in English, but you're reading in Portuguese. I have to assume that what's happening is your mind is getting the content from the Portuguese, that you're not actually understanding the English. But I'm not sure what's happening. But I have a suggestion you may want to try. Why don't you try putting captions in English? Because then the captions will match what you are hearing. And I think it would probably improve your English comprehension even more. So you might want to give that a try. So, good luck. Also, someone is having trouble with her internet. Good luck, Anna. Good luck. I hope you get it fixed. I am terrible at internet. Okay, there's a question about what accent, uh, in what language, uh, does the accent sound close to English? And I think if you are speaking of the vowel sounds that I was speaking of, my impression is that Spanish is kind of close. My impression is that Portuguese is not close at all. Um, also, it's been suggested that maybe Swedish or German are both close to English, but I'm not sure. All right, let's see. Okay, here's the question about the quote from Wittgenstein, he said, give up literary criticism. You cannot understand the relevance of this quote until you read the book. Um, in this book, um, Levis defends um, a particular type of literary criticism where a student reads a book and then writes their criticisms. They read the book and then they write what it means and whether it is well written and what they think of it and how it relates to other things that have been written. This form of literary criticism sharpens the mind and is very good for students. It's an excellent exercise. But Wittgenstein says, give it up. Forget it. Don't do it. Wittgenstein is part of the mass democratic university who wants to dumb it down, dumb down the English classes. And the idea that he should ad advise us to give up literary criticism is crazy, in Liebes' opinion. Okay, and I think this may be the last question I have here. And there will be one more after that. Um, a historical question. Um, could you please talk a bit more about the decision taken in the past concerning the fact of having a democratic mass university instead of an elite? Um, how was the decision taken and made operational and by whom? Now, I have to say, I don't know 
the answer to this question. I only know a few things. I, and I think Olavo may know more about this. I know that there was an organization called the Frankfurt School that um, was communist and socialist. And they had a desire to change education and to make it more socialist. And so they were part of this. Um, also, I know that there were other people in American history who had communist leanings, who met together um, to form a strategy and a plan for changing education in America. And uh, I really don't know the details, but I do know that it was intentional to change education in America. And I also know that in my lifetime, in the 1960s, there were um, experiments in education in which they got rid of serious literature study, study of grammar, study of languages, and they replaced it with social studies that were more about politics, and um, they, were, uh, they were just more political. And my generation, the generation I grew up in, did not learn grammar. We didn't learn language. We didn't learn almost anything. The schools were very bad in my day. So also I know that in America, only a small percentage of people in the 1940s and 50s went to college. But when World War II ended, our government gave a benefit to the soldiers um, for college um, education. It was called the GI Bill. And that enabled many people to go to college. And after that point in time, it became clear that those who went to college got the best jobs. And around about the 1960s and 1970s, um, it became customary for everyone to go to college. And if you didn't go to college, you were condemned to a very low level job. So in the United States, college is for everybody. So I don't really know much more about it than that, but that's that's what I know. Okay, did you have one more question over there? Um, student asks you, what does the title English as a discipline of thought mean? And also, there's, and uh, it also says that Olavo told us that you homeschool your children. What philosophy do you choose to educate them? First, the first question, and then the other. The first question is, what does the title mean? English, the living principle. English as a discipline of thought. Discipline is used in the sense of training. Um, when a child is learning to play the piano, they must practice scales every day. And by this discipline, their fingers learn where to touch the black notes and the white notes, what key um, has each type of note. Their fingers become trained by the discipline of playing the scales. English language is a discipline to train the mind to be able to think. English, or really language study, study of any language, uh, if you are studying the great literary use of your language, literary language is the 
foundation for higher education and higher thought. If you do not have a sophisticated and high understanding of language, you cannot think in a sophisticated way and you cannot express yourself in a sophisticated way and you cannot even understand an argument which is of a high level. So the point of the book is to say that we must begin by teaching our students to master the literary language that they speak before they can understand even the language of science, the language of mathematics, the language of philosophy, and on top, moral language. Um, students cannot even make moral judgments or philosophical judgments or even understand and appreciate the arguments unless they have a high level mastery of the literary language that they are operating in. So this book is putting forth the idea that English or language, literary language, is the discipline which enables a person to think at a high level. So that's what the title means. Now your second question was about homeschooling. Yeah. What was the philosophy? Yeah, what kind of philosophy did you choose to cater to children? Philosophy is not a specific enough term for me, but I will say there are many philosophies of home education. And if you don't know what they are, me telling you which ones I used won't help much. But I'll tell you, I'll use the language that I understood when I began. And if you have questions, you can send a follow up. OK, I began with the desire to give my children a classical education. However, I also wanted my children to, um, there's a phrase we call follow, follow your bliss, um, delight driven education. So it's delight. This isn't working. I'll get another one. Delight driven. Delight driven education or follow your bliss. Bliss means happiness. And so I wanted my children to have a classical education because I wanted them to have a well-trained mind. But I did not like the idea of memorizing lots of facts and working really hard to learn a bunch of stuff. So I wanted them to follow their heart. So what I did was I observed the child. And when I saw them interested in something, I gave it to them. And then I taught my child what he needed to know using that content. For example, one of my daughters loved to sew. So I gave her a doll and I gave her fabric and cloth and needle and thread. And I taught, I didn't even teach her very much, but I taught her um, a little bit about how to sew, but then I also taught her maybe math concepts like this pattern must go down by one third or you will need double the amount of fabric for this ruffle or um, we must multiply by two in order to uh, figure out how much cloth we need. So you can, I had another daughter who was interested in um, dinosaurs. So when she was interested in dinosaurs, 
I went to the library and got, actually it was a laundry basket of books on dinosaurs and left them on the floor and she would read and then I would show her. Maybe she would read about the dinosaurs in Africa and then I would show her on the globe. Where is Africa? And she could find it. And what is the temperature? What is the climate? What is the soil? Where did we find the bones? What about geology? So you see, you can learn so much. You can learn about science from the uh, weather of Africa with the water cycle. There's so much you can do because your child likes dinosaurs. So I would follow the interest of my child and then I would teach them around their interest. And that's called a unit study approach. Also, there's something called the Charlotte Mason approach, which uses real books. Real books. Or sometimes they say living books. This is Charlotte Mason approach. Approach. I used this a lot. Um, real books means no textbooks. Only books that were written to be read for pleasure. A book you would want to read, not one your teacher forces you to read. So we did almost everything from real books. Um, so those are some of my approaches. I have many more. And to tell you the truth, as soon as we finish establishing the English class, I hope if you are interested to teach a whole class on homeschooling and how to homeschool and what has happened in America. So if you're interested in that, let us know because we're interested in maybe having that class. It would be very exciting to, to us. method as exposed in the book how to read a book could we use his method uh, in this class to read Lewis's book um, do you all know about Mortimer Adler yeah, I, I know. okay I'll tell you I've never heard of well actually the name is familiar but I don't know what uh, his method is I am not a philosophy person I am an ESL teacher, English as a second language, by trade. So um, I think, let me ask Alessandro what he thinks. What do you think about Mortimer? He says, no, no, he doesn't want to say anything about it. Maybe you should ask Olavo. Ask Olavo. <laughs> Sorry. There's another question. Brazil, when a foreigner tries to speak using Portuguese slangs, it sounds ridiculous. Is it the same? Uh, it, is it the same when an American listens a foreigner trying to speak slang in English? Um, What's your recommendation in this regard? Okay. I hate to give you the answer. So, th uh, <laughs> the short answer is yes, but there is a huge caveat. So let me tell you, Olavo's son, Pedro, hangs out with my family. He likes my sons. He is good friends with my sons. He likes my daughters. He hangs out at our house a lot. And Pedro is constantly, every day, 
being teased and joked about and laughed at because of his accent and his Brazilian accent. And it is in good fun and he doesn't mind. What he does is when someone says something about the Brazilian, he attacks them with jiu-jitsu and puts them on the ground until they tap. And then he says, okay, I'm a Brazilian and I tapped you, whatever. So the truth is in every language, a foreigner is going to sound kind of funny. No matter how gifted you are, no matter how good you are, it is very likely that you will have an accent. And some people will laugh. And the lower quality American will scoff or make fun. But the wise and kind person will not care. It becomes part of who you are. And one last thing, and this you must listen to and hear and believe because it is very important. The person who will play with the language, who will make jokes, who will try out the accent, try to speak with a funny accent, the person who will try to make a joke in the language, the person who will play and not be afraid of being laughed at is the one who will learn the language the best. If you are afraid of being laughed at, you will not learn to speak. It is a fact of language theory that when a person is nervous and correct and proper, they put down a barrier in their brain and the language cannot get in. This is called the affective filter. Um, it is an emotional barrier to learning. What you want to do is lift the filter so the language can come in. And it is an emotional filter. So decide right now that you will be the funniest guy on the block. And everyone will love to make fun of you and laugh. And you will laugh the loudest and the hardest. And then you will punch them or, or make a joke at them or speak Portuguese in call them bad names in Portuguese, ha ha, that they don't know or something. You will find a way to turn it back and it's all in good fun and it's part of learning. Okay, is that the end? Mm -hmm. All right, next week I'll see you again. Goodbye. <laughs>